I just wanted to start, we usually try to start with a little quote or a, a poem or something to get us going. And I wanted to start um, with a passage from this book called My Darling Alice, which was written by my grandmother and Olivia's grandmother, Mary Wood. Um, and she wrote four books about her four, her two grandmothers and our grandfather's two grandmothers. And this is the one about the grandmother who started out at Poplar Grove. So uh, reading this book, especially if you've been there or if you are familiar with the story is um, an incredible experience of just being immersed in this um, extremely present history. Um, and so I'd like to just start by reading a little passage from the preface of this book. On the floor beside my chair is a shiny lard can in which have been placed to preserve them from mice, silverfish, and damp, important family papers, scraps of early deeds, meets and bounds, courses and distances, fragments of notes in spidery penmanship on fragile paper, rapidly turning brown. Proof that Emery's owned the lands within this nearly illegible boundaries inscribed in evading ink. A tract of land lying on the east side of a river running out of the eastern bay called Chester River and on the north side of a creek on the said river called Corsica Creek, beginning at a marked locust tree upon a point called Corsi's Point, running for breadth northwest and by west 675 perches to a marked oak by the creek side, bounding on the west by a line drawn north from the said oak for length 320 perches on the north by a line drawn southeast and by east 670 and five perches until it intersect a parallel on the south and dot, dot, dot. That is written by Robert Clayton, surveyor. Does one really own land, I wonder? I have lived on mine since my father's death in 1880, and I do not know the answer. Beautiful words on long sheets of legal paper, beautifully copied down by clerks hired for their clear handwriting. To have and to hold such tracts, parts of tracts, pieces and parcels of land above described, with every of the appurtenances, rights of ways, privileges, and water courses, unto the said Alice G. Emery, her heirs and assigns forever. These lands were here before the first white oak was felled by the first Emery. We have scratched its surface with hoes, mule drawn plows, and now tractors. We have changed the look of it from forests to tobacco fields, from peach orchards to wheat and corn fields, and now soybeans. Horse barns have been built and then been converted to dairies and the dairy to storage shed. My grandfather, T General Thomas Emery, built a racetrack in the front meadow of the manor house, Poplar Grove. No trace of it remains. We owners come and go, the land stays. So that kind of sets your scene a little bit. And with that, I would love to turn it over to Olivia Wood who is um, an 11th generation of uh, the family that started out on Poplar Grove. And Olivia is also an art historian who has worked in Washington DC in the museum world for a number of years. And she is also my cousin and she is also working with her husband to uh, re invigorate Poplar Grove. And so I will let her take it from there. Thanks, Mariah. And thank you, River Hearts, for having me. It is a treat to talk about Poplar Grove. Um, when I was getting ready for this, uh, I hadn't gone back and looked at the blog that we interns kept up back in 2008 when we were working on this. And it was really fun to go back and read everything that we um, had written on there because as we were posting on it, we were discovering things in real time as we were taking the letters out of the house and getting them ready to put into storage. So uh, it was really fun to go back uh, down memory lane with that. And I'm just one person who was part of this adventure. There are many others who um, hopefully you get to hear their side of things because um, they have 
all kinds of interesting things to say. And we could probably talk about this a lot longer than 45 minutes. So hopefully you'll hear from them at some point. Um, but in 2008, I was in college. I went to Rhodes College in Memphis and um, I had a work study there uh, in the college archives. So that was, I had didn't know at the time, but was getting me ready for this crazy archiving adventure that I embarked on um, in 2008. Um, and while I was at Rhodes, um, one of the things that I was doing for that work study was I was transcribing these board meeting minutes um, from the 1800s. Uh, so that kind of got me familiar with reading old handwriting on old paper. And uh, there were a lot of, um, it, it was funny because I would get to know the secretary who was taking the, mi the minutes at the board meeting and they would be there for a whole calendar year. And then there would be a new book with a new secretary and with new handwriting that I would get, have to get to know. So that was excellent training for the Poplar Grove Project. <laughs> um, but uh, so that summer I was home um, in Centerville and um, earlier in the year, Adam Goodhart, who some of you all may know from Washington College, he's a professor there and he was teaching a class called Chestertown's America and um, incorporated um, a field trip to Poplar Grove as part of the class. And so the class was there and one of the people that was in the class um, it was a guy named Jim Shelberg who ended up being one of my fellow interns. And um, when they were at the farm, I believe Jim noticed, um, I don't know, I think it was like a milk crate or something, something that you usually wouldn't put letters in. Um, and he noticed that there were all these old pieces of paper poking out and he looked at one and it was pretty old. And then he looked at another one and it was even older. And um, so the class got very excited and Adam got excited and he was the one who connected our family with um, Dr. Edward Pappenfuss, who was the archivist for the Maryland State Archives. And he came out to the farm. Um, it was very hot, uh, but he was very excited to be there in an old house with no air conditioning and going through these um, boxes of letters. Um, and it was really exciting for someone like him who his profession is he was, he's the person who would tell you whether or not these letters were interesting. We didn't really know. We were just there and um, he was very excited about it. So that was kind of how the ball got rolling. And um, we made the decision, my dad, James Wood, who some of you guys may know, he uh, made the decision to move the letters from the farm to the Maryland State Archives because that seemed like a good safe place for them to be and no one was reading them in the house and this way they could be taken care of and stored and digitized and um, read for the first time in many many years um, and we really didn't know how many there were and there were a lot I think um, I don't know how if this number is accurate but I when I was kind of getting ready for this I saw that somebody had mentioned that like 28,000 pieces of paper had been transcribed. And I know it's some of those are front and back, but still it's, it's a lot of <laughs> letters. Um, nobody threw anything away, which I guess is lucky. Um, so uh, when we were assembling our team of fellow interns, there were four of us and it was myself and um, three Washington College alums. Um, Abby Kowalski was our, he supervised the team and uh, each of us kind of had a different area that we were working on um, with the project and he made some really interesting discoveries about Thomas Emery, um, who I think Mariah mentioned in the quote from the book. Um, he had really high hopes for a railroad for the Eastern Shore and uh, he was involved politically and really wanted to get this project off the ground and it was taken a really long time and unfortunately he passed away before he could see it through and then the Civil War happened and he was not able to see it through but um, when we were learning about that we found this amazing map that was had a hand-drawn map of what they hoped for this Eastern Shore Railroad. Um, the mice had eaten through a lot of 
the exciting parts of the map, but it was still there. And um, so Abby made some interesting discoveries about that. Um, there's Jeremy Rothwell, and he was um, really interested in the agriculture and made a lot of interesting discoveries from the papers, um, including different like early court correspondence between some early ancestors and other landowners who were trying out different practices because it's hard to remember that at that point in history, um, American farmers were figuring it out because they hadn't been here that long. <laughs> um, and then there were a lot of receipts that we had from my relative E.B. Emery. He didn't throw anything away. And, uh, but he had a lot of receipts that made it very clear how to figure out how um, a farm like Poplar Grove was financed between the time that he was there, which was 1860 to 1900. So that was very interesting if you're trying to figure out how a farm ran back then. Um, and the last intern was Jim Shelberg, and he made some really cool discoveries about um, William H. Emery, who's an interesting relative. And um, he was reading his letters. He was trying to figure out um, the decisions and motivations that um, William H. Emery uh, went through when he was um, uh, deciding whether or not to fight in the Civil War, because he was an officer for the U.S. Army. And right at the beginning of the war, he resigned, but then he had some kind of change of heart pretty quickly um, and ended up fighting with the Union soldiers. Um, and it's speculated that maybe his wife intervened and she was an interesting character. That's what the family lore is, is that she intervened. Um, but uh, the letters kind of gave a glimpse of that because they were a lot of them were to his wife and he would write burn this at the end of them and she never did. And so that gave us some interesting um, perspectives. And um, I don't think we really know why he changed his mind. It's very interesting when you look back at the family tree at that time, because um, he fought for the Union side and his brother didn't. He fought for the Confederacy and he had two sons that were on the Confederacy. So it was definitely a very complicated time in the Emory household. And But the, seeing the letters was helpful to try and connect some of those dots and think about those motivations. Um, so before we could even get to all those uh, interesting discoveries, we had to get the letters out of the house, which was uh, a real adventure rescue mission. Um, and like I said before, they were stored in trunks. They were stored in milk crates boxes. It was not very glamorous. It was very dusty. There was a lot of mouse poop and mice like chewing through pieces of paper. So a lot of debris and whatnot. Um, and we were wearing gloves. And I actually, I was trying to remember this and I'm pretty sure we wore face masks for the, like some of the really dirty work, which at the time was a real novelty and now is really normal. Um, but that was my first time wearing a face mask, I'm pretty sure. And uh, then we moved them from Poplar Grove to a warehouse um, that is uh, owned by the Maryland State Archives. And that was kind of where we got everything there and tried to figure out how to best organize everything. Um, and it's a great place for the letters to be. It's very climate controlled, um, no pests, no um, humidity. It's, it's a great place for those letters to be. Um, and every day we were there with gloves on, just unfolding everything, reading them, trying to figure out who they were sent to, who they belonged to, to put them in different categories. Um, so every day was a discovery because you had to read them. Um, and uh, there was one very exciting. There were many, every day there was, we'd be quiet for a while and reading them and then someone would say like, oh, listen to this and read it. And one of the exciting ones was, um, I, I, don't, I think it was at LB who maybe, maybe it was Jeremy. I can't remember which one it was, but somebody opened a letter and it was um, talking about the cholera outbreak in Baltimore in the 1800s. And there was a lock of hair in it and we wondered whether or not that was a risk to our health, but it was not, uh, we're all fine, but that was an exciting day. And um, after we got them all the letters organized, we put them in 
acid free folders and had them all digitized um, and the correspondence um, had to be transcribed. So that was when I got to learn some of my family members um, handwriting and um, the area I worked on the most was some correspondence between a brother and sister, and it was a brother named Alexander Hemsley, who was 18, and his sister, Anna Maria, who was 15. And um, Anna Maria actually lived at Cloverfield, which I believe is being restored right now, so that's an interesting little tie to the Eastern Shore. Um, and she ended up over at Poplar Grove because she married Thomas Emery and she brought all of her letters that she and her brother exchanged before she got married over there. And um, <laughs> Alexander at the time was living and working in Chestertown and he was very bored and he was worried about girls and that was the content of every single letter. And um, it was very, it was entertaining to read those because um, the way that he wrote was very different. Um, he would talk about girls and he would call them angelic creatures instead of the way we talk about girls now, but um, we all knew what he was talking about. And um, it was exactly the same kind of sentiment that you would have amongst two siblings or two friends now. Um, he would talk about going to a party and meeting a girl and she said this and he said that and what did she think it meant? and it was very relatable to um, 2008 when I was reading them in 2020. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there was one thing I remembered before I was getting ready for this and I remembered it too late to go back into the archives and find it out. But there was one great letter where he was given um, a branch. I, I think it was a U branch, but I, I'm not positive. Um, but he was given a branch by a girl who's interested in him and this is a time when if you received flowers or plants, I guess, um, it was significant. And he was writing to his sister because he didn't know what it meant. And he was trying to figure out like what this girl's intentions were by giving him this branch. And uh, I never found out what the intentions were because we only had one half of the letters. But um, again, the sentiment was really um, the same <laughs> as teenagers or really anyone is right now when you're trying to figure out what the other person's thinking that you're interested in. Um, and of course, he asked her to burn the letters and she didn't. So I hope that he's not too upset or humiliated that we know all these details about his teenage love life, but um, it was you know, a benefit for us. And, and nice to know that even though these people in this time seem so far away, there's a lot of consistencies with now and, you know, any time. Um, so then after uh, the summer was over, we all went our way separate ways and um, the archives has had interns since me and um, they've worked on various projects and hopefully you can hear from them sometime about what they got up to. But um, a lot of it I think was just continuing the process of organizing them and cataloging them, digitizing the different documents. Um, but I know that some of the interns um, were using the documents to research another archiving project that the Maryland State Archives has put together, which is focusing on the legacy of slavery in Maryland, which is really interesting. And I'm glad that the letters that um, we found were able to kind of help anyone with any research regarding that. So. Um, Hopefully we can find out what they discovered, but um, that's uh, that was my experience. And Mariah, if you do, you want me to proceed to my questions or? Well, I, um, sh yes, sure. And uh, at the same time, um, if anybody has any questions for Olivia, or there are a number of other. Um, Emory descendants in this group. So if you have any questions for any anybody who is part of this uh, extended family, I guess, um, please put them in the chat and and or if you have comments, anything you'd like to say and um, we'll definitely want to hear from everybody. But um, in the meantime, maybe Olivia, you can go on to your questions and then we'll just jump in and kind of um, 
give people a chance if they if they post in the chat. Sure. Um, I think there's two things that since the project I've thought about. Um, and the first one is kind of related back to how the letters are helping historians that are working with the Maryland State Archives uh, focus on the legacy of slavery in Maryland. And I think that um, the documents in the letters, they provide evidence of how our ancestors were complicit. And so you can't ignore it or look away and you have to be aware of it. Um, and you also, um, it's a good, um, it's a piece of evidence that your family isn't just full of good guys, you know, and, and what a good guy means changes um, from generation to generation. But I'm glad that, um, I'm glad that nobody got rid of the documents before we found them in 2008. Um, and that they can be a helpful tool to talk more about Maryland's history and figure out how to, you know, fix the wrongs that have happened in the past. And I hope that they're continuing to be helpful. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to talk to the historians that have actually used the papers. Um, so the other thing that I think of, and this, this is something I think of all the time, because um, working on this project, uh, we, they, when I say that nobody threw anything out, I really mean no one threw anything away. And um, my ancestor, E.B. Emery, he really kept every receipt for everything. If he went to the hardware store and bought a hammer, he kept that. Or if he got a huge um, order of bricks to build an addition, he also kept that. So it was really the small and the big, um, which, as I said, was very helpful for um, people like Jeremy, who were um, interested in understanding how a farm functioned at that time. Um, but I always think about E.B. Emery now when I am going through a bag, like my purse and I have, or my wallet, and I have all my receipts from CVS or going out to lunch and I just throw them away. And I think, I always have this moment where I think, should I keep these? Will someone care that I went to CVS or that I ate lunch? <laughs> and, um, but another thing I think about a lot is that um, we don't write letters anymore. Um, uh, and, all of our, all of the communication that we found in the house in those documents now happens online. And so I just wonder what, how historians in our future will um, know anything about what we were up to <laughs> if they're trying to find out. Because it's not as if someone will come into most of our homes and find um, our letters. Um, I mean, if they do, it's maybe birthday cards or, um, something very formal, but the letters that we were finding were personal stuff. They were things that said, burn this at the end. It was stuff that I'm sure that these ancestors would probably be a little cringy if they knew that we read them, but they are the things that allow us to understand exactly how they were living their lives. Um, and they allowed my grandmother to write her book, um, which I'm biased, but I adore that book. And um, I think it's a great read. But it isn't about somebody who is particularly famous or hugely significant to history. It's just this woman that's my great great grandmother. And I think it's interesting. And I think if you live, live on the Eastern Shore, you might find it interesting. Um, but she was just a regular lady. Um, and obviously, the archives of much more important people are easier to access. But I just wonder how this will all change in our coming generations as everything is digital. So does anyone else think about this? Does this keep anyone else awake at night? <laughs> I don't know if we have any historians in the room, but um, perhaps yeah. Ben Tillman might have something to say about this. Yeah. <laughs> Not to uh, call anybody by name, but um, if you do have something to say, Ben, please jump in. Because um, um, you probably thought about this too. Yeah, well, I, so, I, I mean, some of you know, I work on medieval manuscripts um, as a scholar. And one of the things that I kind of relish emphasizing to my students is that um, we have, you know, we have what we have from the Middle Ages because parchment is an incredibly durable thing to write on. And that, in fact, um, there are any number of 
places, moments you can point to when uh, digital records, important digital records have been irretrievably lost. Um, lo one example, a lot of people don't know that in the September 11th attacks, a, a huge database of looted art from the Nazi era was utterly lost when the Twin Towers came down because the, all the files, the whole database was stored um, in the towers and they didn't have it backed up anywhere. Um, digital media is in many ways even more fragile uh, than, um, than this, than paper, than parchment and things like that. And, and so I think um, it is something, uh, Olivia, I, I walk around thinking <laughs> about that, too, about, about what, what's going to end up being lost. But the lesson, the lesson to everyone is get yourself an external hard drive and back up your computer on a regular basis. <laughs> you, might, you might want it someday or someone else might want it someday. But even that, I was talking with a friend just last weekend. We were complaining about, we both have, it's Catherine, I think she's on here somewhere. Catherine and I were um, both talking about how we have external hard drives that have photos from high school and early college. And both of those external hard drives have kind of like broken or maybe they're not broken, we don't really know. And they could be salvageable, but we're almost too scared to take them to someone to find out whether or not all those things are gone. So then we were like, well, should we have printed everything? And is that practical? And so I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I think Pam had her hand up. You can um, unmute yourself, Pam, if you want. And there we go. At one point when I was closing up my in-laws house, I came across this huge box of um, records that my husband's grandmother had kept. And she had been an Iowa farm wife. And she had stacks of little journals where she mar recorded what she purchased every single day and the price of it just years and years from about 1917 to about 1945. And it was, I mean, it was just a wonderful treasure trove. Uh, ben would know when I, when, I, when I say the Anal School, it was perfect for the Anal School. It was the minutia of everyday life. And um, I did send that off to Iowa because, and of course they were just thrilled to see it. Um, just what this typical farm woman did every single week, what she bought, what she, what she paid for it. Sometimes she even marked where she bought it. It was just wonderful. Yeah, and you can kind of um, write a story based on that. And um, I'm seeing in the chat that somebody has said about photos online, um, the way that we normally see photos is maybe in an album is that they're positioned in a meaningful way but without somebody making that effort like for example my iPhoto library <laughs> I mean you could I guess you could write a story um, but it, it would be less of a cohesive and comprehensible story than if I were getting you know the way we used to printed photos and carefully choosing them and pasting them. Not that I would probably ever actually do that, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the other side. <laughs> um, but yeah, there is, it's such a fire hose of information now, right? Like how many emails did you send today versus how many letters would you have written? And so I think it does make it harder to wade through if, or if it even gets those, all those photos are going to be in boxes that somebody will discover in about 200 years. <laughs> yeah, they'll end up at the Maryland State Archives, Mariah, don't worry. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't get destroyed in a fire. <laughs> um, it looked like maybe Margo would, wanted to say something. Let's see. You can, can you unmute yourself? Because there you go. I don't. Okay, good. There you are. Good. Um, the difference between the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Historical Society in terms of uh, preserving documents or how, how does that choice get made or how does that work? 
Um, I'm not sure how we made that choice. Um, I think dad, James, you might be able to answer that question. Um, uh, I think it, it might have been the relationship that um, Adam had with the archivist. Yeah. Also, my dog might start barking at me. So. <laughs> Um, I would just add, I don't know if you can hear me yeah, and, yeah. um, and I have a lousy connection, so forgive me. Well, all I can say is Adam introduced us to Dr. Papafus, who's a wonderful guy. And, um, he was standing around this table and bleed, you know, Eastern shore, humid weather. And we just showed him a sampling of what we thought was important. And he goes, this is significant. <laughs> and it wasn't significant like George Washington signatures, but it was sort of a time capsule in one place over a fairly long time for American history. And so, you know, we were quickly connected with the Maryland State Archives and, um, and we just didn't really interact with the historical society though. Um, I think we do, you know, we, well, that, that's my, and Dr. Papafoos was, you know, he just really fun, interesting, exciting, excited about this kind of stuff. Um, and it was the mundane stuff, you know, all wrapped up 1857, 1856. And, you know, there, there's stuff we don't even know yet that I think is going to be helpful when we renovate the house. Like, when were those bricks bought and which edition did they go to and start connecting it to the physical grounds and um but it's all more than a notion to do it um and there you know the land itself and the deeds and i had a squabble about you know quick claim that someone tried to take some land and you know not only do we have the land records in the courthouse we have the originals that are in color from 1830, you know, it just, you can't even believe it. Um, and, um, and there's one thing that happened, you know, the one thing I think is cool, and I don't know that we've really explored it is like, we, we only put one half the letters that the correspondence out there, but there's the other half somewhere. And I, we started to get a taste of connecting those two from other libraries um when we had the thing at washington college which was wonderful you know some distant cousins we didn't even know came and they brought a plant that was named after an emery they brought um a revolver they brought just all these different things that we we had no connection to but it starts the conversation and um you know i bill murdoch in easton is an amateur genealogist and I sent him the link about today and but he's did a 16 page family tree essentially and everybody's ever contacted me I found on that and he's just doing it for fun so you know to start to weave together all this stuff I think is <clears throat> is the interesting part so yes um the historical society I'm sure has information that we don't even know about and uh, but putting it out there and digitizing it. And I don't think Olivia really talked about it, but um, the scan of the document is there and then next to it is the transcription. And some of them are hard to read as she said, but people can go online themselves and help with the transcriptions and even correct them just like on Wikipedia. Like if you don't think Olivia got it right, you can go say, I think it's really such and such word or you know, in the context and it doesn't mean you you're correcting anyone, but you're, you're the commentary can, can happen online and into the future. Um, I'm really interested in the horse stuff. And I found this incredible account of something Dan Tabler kept putting in the record observer about the world's fastest racehorse. And I twice Googled and the second time I found it, it took me 15 years to find this article about a race on Long Island, a filly that was bred on Poplar Grove, beat these three colts in a match race in 1834. And the next article 
said not only had Lady Clifton beat the boys in Long Island, eight days later she did it again in Hoboken. And, you know, it's just, I've been looking for that for 15 years. And at the day I found it, I was like telling my coworker who could care less. Um, you know, it's that little nuggets that I just know there's more of. And um, so that's all I got. I just wanted to share a couple of those things. I, I love that. And I didn't know that you could uh, be part of the transcription. So I'm definitely going to find some time to go do that. Um, so Olivia, <laughs> Pam is asking how much renovation does the house need? And I'll say, Olivia, before, before this uh, conversation started, um, Olivia had said she, to me, maybe she should have tried to do it from Poplar Grove so people <laughs> could see the peeling paint, but I'll let you go ahead and um, talk about how much renovation the house needs. <laughs> um, well, no one's lived in the house for quite some time. Um, I think it's been 20, years ish since someone's been in the house um and uh different parts of it are in need of different things um so uh, i think it really depends on which room you're in um but uh we're coming at it with a glass half full optimistic attitude which i'm sure there'll be days when we feel less half full but right now we are positive um but something that um, Eric and I have been talking about and I've been talking about with um, my dad and my family is um, just uh, that a house like Poplar Grove, um, it's kind of outlived its purpose in our modern world. And um, because the house does need a lot of work, um, we can make some decisions about um, how to make it leave less of an impact on us who would have to you know pay the electricity bill but also the planet just i we would like to make some sustainable choices on how um the house just exists you know, on our planet that is needing um people to make those kinds of decisions so I do feel like that's a silver lining for the house needing so much work uh, is that we can think about those. And it just seems like a great time to be thinking about that as a lot of people get very creative with um, making their homes more sustainable. Maybe if it's okay with uh, uh, you guys, we can take some pictures and share them of the inside of the house. I know we had a couple of pictures of the outside on the website and uh, maybe we could well i've got a give, few give people an idea i've got a few if you let me share my screen i can show them oh gray was just there gray is our cousin and she's an architect and so she kindly walked through the house uh, recently and um and she gray was optimistic too and she is a professional so i think that that <laughs> <good fun. laughs> okay gray i think you can share your screen now if i did that okay correctly. Okay, there's there's Olivia. Oops. Uh, hang on. Yeah, there's a there's Olivia with her husband in front of yeah, Poplar yeah. Grove. You see that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is uh, <laughs> well. This is probably the worst of the rooms that doesn't even have a floor. It's and a blank it, slate. <laughs> it's, absolutely, you know, it's. Uh, and here's Olivia sort of <laughs> looking a little <laughs> bothered <laughs> and the, uh, in the upstairs. And, uh, but this shows the real potential. It's a, it's a really elegant house. It's quite, quite beautiful, the high windows and the just nicely proportioned spaces. Um, there's a backside. Which I just mowed that lawn, so it looks even tidier now. Good, good. <laughs> but you can see all of the additions, sort of every every little bit of it was added on at some point. Even this uh, this bay window was added on to uh, an older L. Oh, and here's the, here's the dock. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> one beautiful. Well, <laughs> beautiful Emory Creek. <laughs> so there's a lot of work in it. That's all. But it's a really beautiful house. And, that's and Olivia has great ideas about 
how to how to um, make it so that 21st century people can live in it while kind of respecting the history and the aesthetic and the, um, and the background, but also looking forward to, you know, how do we live now? How do we think about how our buildings, this would tie in with the salon that Greg Farley did about green building. Um, you know, how do we make sure that what we're doing is not ha taking too much of a toll on the human beings who have to maintain and, and uh, finance these projects and the planet and does it suit you know the the world that we live in today can i uh ask if you've sensed any spirits in the house i personally have not i know that people have um actually so uh one of the projects i've given myself this summer um because uh uh I'm not, we're not ready to, you know, get to work inside the house is to tidy up the family uh, cemetery um, as a way to garner some goodwill with the ancestors. Um, I figure it Good. can't hurt. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> I'm sure that there are, and people have their own stories about it, but I'm hoping that I won't encounter them, or if I do, they'll be friendly. Sure. I have a I have an anecdote. Um, when I was quite small, um, I don't remember, maybe 10 years old, I was not at Papa Road, I lived on the third floor. Um, the, uh, my cousin Allie, Alice Martinez Emery, was the widow of Lloyd Emery's father, who was also called Lloyd, I believe. Lloyd was uh, the cousin who um, left Poplar Grove to James when he died maybe 20 years ago or so. Uh, and uh, I don't remember any spirits, but I learned um, much later that uh, Cousin Allie, who I just thought of as Cousin Allie, uh, came from Wilmington. Her maiden name was Martinez, and she was a social worker who uh, worked at the Department of Social Services in Centerville and pretty much single-handedly uh, kept the farm going through the depression. I, don't, I have no idea how she managed it. Has, I'm, a, I'm a retired social worker, so that made an impression on me. Hmm. So did she find I mean, did she leave her papers for us to learn that? No. Her name doesn't sound familiar, but there were a lot of papers, so I might well, have Well, it, it was Alice, it was Alice Emery. <laughs> Alice M. Emery, I guess. Hmm. Well, maybe Dr. Pappenfuss knows how she did it. <laughs> so we're, all uh, we're actually over our time, so um, I want to just uh, give everybody a last chance to um, pipe up with a question or a or a comment before we start to wrap up here. Um, and I think that this I would love to do a second round of this um, maybe in a couple of months with we could um, invite some of the other folks who worked on the project with Olivia, but also maybe who have worked with the papers um, since then. And I know that there have been articles written and, and research done. So I, I think that would be great to hear about. Um, and so I will turn it over to Anne to close us out in just a moment, but um, before I do, I just wanna again, thank everybody for coming and thank you for um, participating in this River Arts Salon that is an idea that we kind of invented a few months ago when we were quickly trying to figure out how we were gonna keep our community connected and engaged with the arts during this very strange and challenging period of time. And um, 
if you haven't joined us before, keep your eyes out on what we do because every single week we have a different topic. We often have a guest and they have all, especially including Olivia, been interesting, friendly, exciting. We've had, there are people in this chat who have been guests and um, other people who perhaps will be in the future. Um, and if you have suggestions about guests or topics that you would like to um, see us host, please let me know. Um, and with that, I will let Anne uh, get us closed out here. And before we end with our signature closing of a toast of some sort, Olivia, we um, have a number of different comments. We have people, you can check the chat, people saying thank you and everything else. But um, do you have a website or a blog or anywhere that like progress is being shared? Because M. Morrissey, who I don't know, but most of you probably oh, do, <laughs> yes, has asked. Uh, that's my Aunt Marguerite. Hi. Um, so if you want to go back and revisit the pro like the archiving project that ha that I participated in 2008 and which other interns at the archives um, continued with, um, there is a blog that um, I don't think has been active since 2012. I think that it, it might have graduated to another platform um, that the Maryland State Archives might know about. Um, but I think Mariah linked that. Um, as far as our adventures with the house and the future of whatever we get up to, um, I know I would like to document it just because after doing this project, it, I'm definitely someone who wants to document it now. Um, everything else has been about this house and this farm. So um, yes, we do plan to uh, document it somehow. And when that comes to fruition, I will certainly share it with you guys. Thank you. And I was gonna say, and Aunt Marguerite gave me the idea for how we should end up because she also had a comment that suggested that this would be great educationally for teachers. And last week's salon, we had a musician who Skyped in or Zoomed in from Germany to join us. And we talked about connecting across distances and we talked about the importance of mail. And you brought that up again today. And I think there's some synergies here for how we can connect with each other how we can figure out you know, what's important and how we can maybe help all of these people who are new homeschoolers and people learning from home and, and share history in a really meaningful living way with people of all ages. So thank you for, for doing this for us today. This has been really fun. And I, I have to say, I Googled real quick what um, presenting someone with a U branch means. <laughs> didn't come up with anything super meaningful because I wanted to wish you all like being presented with you branches, but I'm not sure that's a good thing. So I'm just going to say <laughs> cheers and thank you for being here with us. And here's to mail and memories and keeping it all alive. Cheers. Cheers, cheers everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much. Cheers. Thank and you, we will everybody. share this um, video in the coming days and of course, uh, when we do host a round two of the Poplar Grove Salon, we'll let you all know so that you can join us for that too. Thank you. Bye, Olivia. Bye, James. Bye. Thank you.